And after performing the five daily salah, the Prophet ﷺ is being commanded to perform the Tahajjud Salat. The so one we have the five daily salat and then the Tahajjud Salat. And this was the time where the Prophet Sallallahu was going through a lot of hard trips in his life. This was just before the time of migrating to Medina. It was a very harsh period of time for the Prophet Sallallahu So the solution that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given to him, enjoy prayer salat and add on to that, now fill do something extra, not only the five days salat, but perform your tahajjud salat. And as long as you perform your tahajjud salat, Allah has promised him maqam al mahmud That says, Asa ayya ba'athaka rabbuka maqam al mahmud Maybe Allah is going to grant you the praiseworthy station. You want to have the highest status amongst human beings on the day of judgment. No other human being is going to be able to reach your ranks. So again, the solution is Salat and Yatahajjad Salat. Compulsory Salat and Yatahajjad Salat. And it removes all the hardship. And then after that, Allah tells us about some of the ease given to the Prophet One was him being able to migrate. And his exit from Makkah was Mukhraja Siddiqin, was an exit of truthfulness, a smooth exit. And his entry into Medina was a smooth entry into Medina as well. That is a relief given to him. And then the second relief was Allah had granted him victory over Makkah. The one that's leaving all that hardship. Being able to reach into Medina safely, ensuring that he's well formed and established now in Medina, and then Allah grants him a next relief, which is you're going to conquer Makkah. And you're going to have that conquest. You're going to be the one controlling the Kaaba and the one controlling Makkah. And then Allah tells us about the Quran. Allah says, the Quran that Allah has given to us, He says, it is a shifa and a rahmah for the believers. It is a shifa and a rahmah. So now, additional to your salat, additional to the hajjah, is, is mentioned here about the Quran. So this is how important is the Quran. So even though you might not understand what you're reading, Allah says the Qur'an in itself, He didn't say the translation of the Qur'an, He says the Qur'an is a shifa. The Qur'an is a rahmah. Meaning if you understand it or you don't understand it, it will still be a means of cure for you. It will still be a means of mercy for you. All your solutions, all your problems is in the Qur'an. So you pray your salat and then you read your Qur'an and Allah is going to grant you ease. Allah is going to grant you happiness. Allah is going to remove all the hardship and difficulties that you have in your life. Now Allah tells us in 83. So 82, Allah is telling you the, as you can say, the third solution to remove your difficulties. Because we have the five daily salat. We have the five daily salat. Tahajjad Salat, woman and lady, Fatahajjad Dihina Filat Allah. And now Allah tells us of the Quran. So you have three solutions to remove our problems. And anyone who uses these three solutions, Allah is going to take care of your problems. It is not that you won't have problems. As long as you are alive, we are going to be tested. So they are going to be problems. There are going to be hardships, there are going to be difficulties, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to help you to overcome them as long as you abide by these three solutions, which is the fard, the tahajjal or all the nafil salat, and then you have the Quran. 
So in this ayah now Allah says, وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا عَلَى الْإِنْسَانِ أَعْرَنَ وَآبِ جَانِبِ Allah says, whenever we grace man, whenever we bestow an'amna, come from word ni'mata. Ni'mata which means favor. So an'amna, whenever we favor human being. So he is being given favors. If you're being given favors, which means your hardship has been removed. So sometimes we use these solutions we are given above, and our hardships have been removed, and now we are in a state where we are finding happiness. There's happiness, there's joy, there's prosperity. Our businesses are going well. Our jobs are going the way how we wanted it. I'm getting that promotion I want. I'm getting this new vehicle, I'm getting uh, my home, everything. Allah says, وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ When we favor mankind, we grant him favors. أَعْرَضَ Allah says, He turns away and distances And He distances Himself away from Allah. He distances Himself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you start to pray, you are going through hardship and this is something we see on a regular basis. Somebody is going through a tough situation in life. They come and they start to pray their salat. And they'll spend some extra time and they'll be picking up the Quran and be reading Quran. And they'll be doing this on a regular basis every day. You'll see them. They will come to the masjid, they'll pray, and they'll read some Quran, and then all of a sudden, things start to get better in their life. That hardship that they were going through, all of a sudden it starts to go away. Things start to look up. They start to get interviewed for another job. They start to, to see their way now. And as they start to see their way now, they start to hardly see them coming to pray and read Quran now. They start to forget about Allah. They use the solutions in order to remove the hardship and to get the favors from Allah and then when they get the favors from Allah they forget back Allah they turn away from Allah and then sometimes the only time you see them again is when they are hit with a with a infliction again when they are hit with a calamity when there is some hardship in their life then again you see them so Allah says وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ أَعْرَضَ وَنَعَى بِجَانِبِي When we favor man, he turns away from Allah. Sometimes with favors comes more responsibility. The more you get, sometimes is the more responsibility is placed on you. So for example, you had a less small business. You don't have that much responsibility. Just do what you have to do and then you close up and you have a lot of time for yourself. But if Allah starts to expand that, and you now, instead of having one small business, you know what, I want to open up somewhere else. Instead of having one business, you have two businesses now. As an individual, two businesses, more responsibility. You have to ensure you have time for this one as well as that one. And like that, the more Allah increases, the more of the dunya is the more responsibility and the more further away many a times we get from Allah. Because now we are being more and more occupied with what Allah has given to us. So sometimes we, we start to forget who has given it to us and we start to just focus on what we have, trying to fulfill that responsibility of only the favors that Allah has given to us and not the one who has given us the favors. There was this famous <coughs> narration of the Prophet وسلم, or this incident that took place during the time of the Prophet وسلم, where this man he was living very close to the masjid. He was very poor and every single day he had the masjid, every day. The Prophet used to see him for all the salat. He was always forced, always there. And, but he was very poor. So he came and he said to the Prophet, O Messenger of Allah, 
Make dua to Allah for me to get wealth, for me to be rich. I want some wealth. You see, I'm always here. Make a dua. The Prophet told him, no, no, no. Don't ask for that. Because the Prophet he knows, if you get that, I'm hardly going to see you. Right now, you're here so often. Don't ask for that. He says, no, Ya, ya Rasulullah. If you ask for that and I get wealth, you know me. See me here every day. You think I would give up this just for some wealth? No, I just want a little comfort, but I wouldn't give this up. So the Prophet sallallahu he made dua and with the barakat of the Prophet sallallahu his dua is always accepted. As long as he makes a dua asking Allah for this individual to be given wealth, he's going to get wealth. So he gets, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi makes dua and starts to get wealth. Wealth in the form of livestock. Get a lot of animals, a few animals. And as he gets this animal, the place that he was living now become too small. It was hard for him to take care of so much animal at that small place that he was living. So he moved to a better location. Blue moving to a better location is so that he could take care of the favors Allah has given to him. Look at what we're talking about. He gets favor now. Move away from the masjid a little farther away so that he can take care of the favors. And as he is away from the masjid and his wealth is increasing, he's getting more and more of these animals to rear. Being so far away from the masjid, he will only come for the daily prayers, not the nightly prayers. Because in those days, there weren't any kind of light to walk a, a long distance. So he will only be there for Zohar, he will be there for Aser, and by Maghrib and Maghrib, Isha and Fajr, he had to pray where he was living, a far, far away from the mansion. So now the Prophet is only seeing him for two salat. And then he gets more wealth, becomes more busy, he didn't have time now to leave all of this that he had to take care of to go for Zohar and Aser. He said, what? I will pray right there. I have to pray right there, stop going, to even so on, I say, and he will only come now for Juma, one Salat. And Allah even increased. This is the, the barakah of the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu He asks for wealth for this individual, and he's going to get wealth. Gets more, that he even stopped coming for Juma. At one point in his life, every single Salat, but more favors, he's looking at taking care of these favors. So no Jama, praying only Zohar and Jamali, which is a very serious thing. The Prophet after three Jamas, he didn't see him. Say, what happened to so and so? I'm not seeing him. The companion said, he has gotten so much of wealth, so much of animals. He can't make it to leave all those animals to come down for Jama again. And then when the, the ayat of Quran came down, where Allah instructed you to pay zakat, Allah, the, the Prophet has sent two of the companions by him for zakat, and he refused to give zakat. He refused to give zakat. He didn't even want to give zakat, even though all that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he didn't want to give the zakat. And then when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, he now brought his zakat. He brought the zakat to the other companions, to Abu Bakr, to Umar, to Uthman. No, none of them wanted his zakat. Because when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him for the zakat, he did not want to give any zakat. So, this is what Allah is saying, وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا لِلْإِنسَانِ أَعْرَلَ وَلَا أَبِجَانِ Whatever Allah gives you favor, gives mankind favor, instead of being so grateful to Allah and continue to turn more and more to Allah, we end up turning towards the favors and turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the Abi Janibi. Wa ila masa wa sharu kana ya usa. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa ila masa wa sharu kana ya usa. It says, whenever adversity touches him, he is in despair. 
So when he gets back, hardship again, because this is life. Life is such that one day you you see you you're in prosperity, you're in ease and comfort, and the next day you have some some sort of worries or difficulties to go through. It says when that hit him back again, now he's in despair. He's worried, he's concerned. Now he starts to think back about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but whilst he was in ease, forget totally about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> so it is mentioned, whenever Allah favors an individual wealth, whenever Allah favors him with good health, whenever Allah grants him fat, victory, whenever Allah grants him sustenance, whenever Allah grants him whatever he desires, Instead of him being more obedient to Allah, he becomes arrogant. He becomes arrogant. He fears that he has achieved so much and he turns away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another ayat of the Quran, Allah says, فَلَمَّا كَشَفْنَا عَنْهُ دُرَّ مَرَّا كَأَلَّمْ يَلْعُونَ إِلَىٰ دُرِّ Allah says, whenever we remove a harm from someone, and that is, for example, someone might have been going through some hardship, might have been going through some sort of sickness, some sort of illness. And in those situations, you raise your hands and you beg from Allah. Allah says, whenever you raise your hands and you beg from Allah, Allah helps you, Allah removes it. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes that hardship or that difficulty from your life, Allah says sometimes, Marra ta'allam yaluna ila dhuri masar. He walks past as if he has never made any dua to Allah during those hard times. Sometimes, the same masjid you are in, begging and praying to Allah. When Allah removes it, you drive past while he's hearing the azan and you don't have time to stop it. Allah says you pass by as if you never raise your hands and were begging him to remove that hardship. Because now you're, you're enjoying it. You're in comfort, you're in happiness. You forget about Allah. Allah says, While speaking about those people in the ocean, you're in a boat in the sea, and the waves are there, and you're begging. Allah says, At that time, you're only going to beg Allah to save you. But Allah says, As soon as He saves you or puts you on land, you forget about Allah. Well, I said, this is the nature of human being. That only at a time when they are going through that hardship, then they remember Allah. But when they are ease, they forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ask Allah to protect us from that. So we see at the sequence of this ruku, Allah gives us solution. Solutions that help us to remove our hardship. And when we use them and our hardships are removed, Allah says, don't be like those who forget Allah when your hardships are removed. If Allah remove your hardship, continue to thank Allah. Continue to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's one hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, if you want Allah to remember you during the time of your hardships, then remember Allah during the time of ease. Again, if when you're going through a hardship, you want Allah there to listen to you, to take you out from that hardship, then whenever you're at ease, you should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't wait for only when hardship hits you to raise your hands and beg from Allah. It should be a custom even during our happy times to raise our hands and beg from Allah. The next ayah is verse 84. Allah says, قُلْ قُلْنُ يَعْمَلُ عَلَىٰ شَاكِلَةِ فَرَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ هُوَ أَهْدَى سَبِيلًا Allah says, see, He does according to His disposition. The Lord knows best who is better guided in the way. <coughs> So Allah tells us, Kul Kul, say to them, I was commanding the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say to unbelievers and those 
who turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That each one do ala shakilati. However, he is whatever he is inclined to do. Allah tells us what we should do as the beginning of this of this ruku. Pray in our five daily salat, pray in the tahajjud, read in our Quran. That's what Allah tells us to do. Allah tells us as well, want us do me like those who forget Allah. Now in the last verse, In the last verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that she should say to those who choose a different path. Instead of choosing the path of obedience, instead of choosing the path of praying and reading Quran, Allah tells them, do whatever you want to do. That is in short. I already advise you what to do. I already advise you how to get Jannah. I already advise you how to remove your hardship. I already advise you where your solutions are. But if you don't want to listen to me, then Yamalo ala shakili. Do whatever you want, whatever your heart's desire to do, shakila, refers to whatever your desire is inclining towards. That is whatever you feel like to do. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do. <coughs> So Allah is telling them, do whatever you want to do, go ahead and do. Kul kullu ya'malu ala shakilati. Because we as human beings, Allah did not create us as He has created the other creation that they do whatever He tells them to do. Other Creation, they don't have a choice. They just do exactly what Allah tells them to do. But Allah has created us with a free choice that we can choose whatever we want. And out of Allah's mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just leave us there for us to figure out what it is that we supposed to be doing. Allah has spelled it out for us in the Quran what we should be doing if we want the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where it says, if you don't have any haya, you don't have any shame, you don't have any shame, you don't have any modesty, then do what you want. As the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here Allah says, kul kul ya'mula shakilati, because Allah is not going to force us. Allah is going to advise us and leave it up to us as human beings. Now it is upon us to choose whatever we want. And like that in the world we see some people they choose obedience and some people, be it they can read the Quran a hundred times, but yet they still remain in their disobedience. They still remain as unbelievers. So Allah says, after giving you all this advice, I'm closing off now. This is what Allah is saying. This is the conclusion to this, as we say, this ruku. Let them do whatever they want to do. Whoever wants to obey Allah, let him obey Allah. Who do not want to obey Allah, don't obey Allah. Allah says, فَرَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ هُوَ أَحْدَى سَبِيلًا Allah says, because your Lord knows best who is most deserving to be guided. Allah knows best who is most deserving to be guided. If Allah sees that your heart is pure 
and you are searching for the truth and you want to change your life, you want to be on a path of obedience to Him, Allah is going to help you for you to remain guided. But if Allah sees that you do not want guidance, you prefer your disobedience, you prefer to follow your nafs and your desires, then Allah is going to allow you to go down that path. Allah is not going to force your limbs to come on the path of guidance. It's all about our choice. So what Allah has done, He has given us some valuable advice. Now it is for us to either take it in order to get our success, or we leave it alone and be a part of those who are the inhabitants of the fire of Jahannam, one of the two. It is left upon us. The next ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the next ruku, Allah says, وَيَسْأَلُونَ كَانِ الْرُوحِ قُلِ الْرُوحُ مِنْ أَمْلِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Allah says, they ask you about the ruh. They ask you about the spirit. Say, the spirit belongs to the domain of my Lord. And you are given only little knowledge. So, there's a incident that took place when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, where the Quraysh they, they went to Medina because the people of Medina, the Ahlul Kitab, they were well versed in their scriptures. So they went to them asking them questions that they could come up to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and ask him to find out if he's really a prophet or not. So they went and the people of Medina, the Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, they gave them three questions to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa One was about Ashab al Kaf, about the people of the Kiev, the sleepers of the Kiev, which will be discussed in Surah al -Kaf. The second question was about Dhul Qarnayn. Yes, Alunaka and Dhul Qarnayn. They ask you about Dhul Qarnayn. That also is mentioned in Surah al -Kaf. And the third question is Yes, Alunaka and the Ruh. They ask you about the Ruh, the Spirit, the Soul. These were the three questions they told the Quraysh, go back and ask him, go back and ask Muhammad these three questions. So they went back to Mecca and they asked the Prophet these three questions. And the Prophet didn't have answers. Those are things that had to be revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the Prophet he did not know how to read or write. So anything, the whole Quran was coming through revelation. So what he said, he expected as they asked this question, Allah was going to send a revelation by now, at least until tomorrow. From now to tomorrow, Jibreel is going to come because Jibreel is coming very often. So definitely Jibreel is going to come and give me the answer to this. So, so he told them, come back tomorrow. I will answer those three questions tomorrow. And as they came tomorrow, tomorrow rich, and as they came to find out the answer, no Jibra'il came. No revelation. Because he did not say, Inshallah. He did not say, Inshallah. He does say, come back tomorrow. And Allah, in Surah Kaf, this is mentioned as well. Allah tells them, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَعِلُ ذَلِكَ قَدَىٰ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Do not say that you're going to do something tomorrow, except that you say, Insha'Allah. And Allah withhold revelation from the Prophet ﷺ for a period of time. While the unbelievers decided to laugh at him, Decided to mock him that you are saying you are a prophet and you told us to come back tomorrow. Look, days have passed and you can't answer these questions. And then afterwards, to pray, he brought that eye telling him, next time make sure you say inshallah. But then he told him the answers to the questions. So this was in, in Makkah. 
So it is mentioned that this was the incident that took place in Makkah. And then as he went to Medina, there were others who asked him back again about the rope. Some of the Abdul Kitab now in Medina asked him back about the rope. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that moment Allah gave him back the same answer again about the rope. Sometimes you feel that after they asked a second time, something more would have come about the rope, but the same the same reply about the rule was given to the Prophet Sallallahu So the incident that took place in Medina, the Prophet Sallallahu even Masood said, I was walking with the Prophet Sallallahu in one of the farms of Medina. And while he was resting under a date palm, a few people from amongst the Yahud, the Jews, passed by him. And some of them, they were conversating with one another and they said, let us ask him about the rope. And the other said, no, no, don't ask him. Let us don't ask him about it. And then they came and they decided, yes, we're going to ask him about it. And they asked him about the rope. And the Prophet sallallahu he continued to reply. <coughs> and for the land to know you, he lied. Ibn Masood said, I thought that revelation now is going to be revealed to him. That something else Ibn Masood already knew about that question which was asked already in Makkah. But it was vague when we, when we look at the, the actual verse about the rule. There's no details about the rule in the ayat. So now he's asked the question for a second time. So Ibn Masood says, I thought that new revelation now is going to come to him. Because in Makkah, those people didn't want to believe. They were just testing him. But now these Jews are asking him, maybe new revelation is going to come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited back the same ayat. The same ayat. So when yes, Aluna Kali Ru, they ask you about the room. Listen to what Allah says. Allah says, Go, say to them. A ruhu min amri rabbi. The ruh is from the command of my Lord. The ruh is from the affairs of my Lord. That is, Allah knows about the ruh. We as human beings, we have very limited knowledge about the ruh. Allah knows about the ruh. Wa ma utitum min al ilmi illa qalila. And wa ma utitum. And you were not given knowledge about it except little. So we know very, very little about the rule. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows about the rule. So leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when it says they are asking him about the rule. <coughs> the in the Quran itself Ru, the word Ruhan is mentioned for three different things. So Ru one, Ru is mentioned for the actual soul. Allah uses the word Ru speaking about the soul. Now we have our life. Without the Ru, our body is useless. Our body cannot be in use without the Ru. When the Ru is taken from the body, that is what we call mouth and death. Because even though you have all your organs, so you have your eyes, your nose, your heart, everything, when that rule comes out, nothing is functional again in the body. The body cannot do anything. The body stops function completely. So the only thing that keeps the body moving is the rule. So when the rule is taken out, the body is of no use. Similarly, when the, whilst we were in the womb of our mothers and it was a lump of flesh and before the four months, there's no row as yet there. You wouldn't hear, you wouldn't, the, the mother wouldn't feel any kicking, any movement at that time. It's only when the row is placed and there's life, then there's some sort of movement. So only when there's ruh, the ruh in the body, then we have, as you can say, we have life. 
So we can say the rule is like life. Without the rule, there's no life. That is the spirit. So this is one usage of the rule in the Quran. The next, uh, the next is Jibrail alayhi salam. Jibrail alayhi salam is used Allah when Allah make mention of Jibrail alayhi salam. He calls him the rule. And I said, but a surah that we all know, which is surah al Qadr. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَرْءٍ تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ وَالرُّوحُ فِيهَا The rule there is not our soul, is not our life. The rule mentioned there in Surah Al-Qadr, Prophet Jibreel a.s. تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ So the rule refers there to Jibreel a.s. So one interpretation of Ru is the life. The next usage of the word Ru is given to Jibreel alayhi salam. And the third usage of Ru is given to Jesus alayhi salam. When Allah speaks about Jesus alayhi salam, kalimatuhu wa ruh, wa ruhu min. Allah says, Isa alayhi salam is the word of Allah and his ruh. And his ruh. So again, the word ruh referring to Jesus alayhi salam. And also the fourth is mentioned at the Quran as well. In chapter 42, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while speaking about the Quran, Allah calls the Quran ruh. So here now the question is, Wayas alunaka and the ruh. They are asking you about the ruh. But Allah in the Quran, Allah makes big mention of four different things and say that these things are the rule. So he calls Jibra'il the rule. Because of our light that we have the rule. He calls the Quran the rule. He calls Jesus alayhi salam the rule. So they're asking you about the rule. But according to the majority of the commentators, the rule here that they were specifically asking about is the light that we have. And Allah says, Allah knows best about it. Allah has all the knowledge about the ruh. <coughs> the Ahl Kitab, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they asked about the ruh. And then when the reply came, this is the reply here in this ayat. Allah says, the ruh is from the affairs of my Lord. And you were not given knowledge except little. So they were offended when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, You don't really have no knowledge. You are given small amount of knowledge. So they said to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how could you say that we were given small amount of knowledge when we have the Torah? When we have the Torah with us. And Allah says, وَمَا يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا That whoever is given the hikmah, the wisdom, which is many mentioned that refers to the Torah, فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا has been given an abundance of knowledge. So you're seeing at one place, Allah tells you that we were given an abundance of knowledge, and now you're seeing that we were given a little bit of knowledge. That one place you say we have a lot, now you say we don't really have anything. The Prophet وسلم, said to them, he recited a verse in the Quran which is found in Surah Al Luqman. Allah says, if all the trees on the earth were to turn into pen, and all the water in the ocean was to turn into ink, you cannot, you will not be able to write the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you have, even though Allah says you have a lot, you have a lot to the world that you are living in. But when it comes to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have a little bit. 
Your knowledge could not be compared to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have. We have nothing but regards to knowledge if you try to compare it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is nothing in the sight of Allah. So when it comes to the room, when Allah says you have no knowledge of the room, <coughs> the amount of knowledge you have is what Allah has given to you. And that amount that Allah has given to Allah is saying, I have only given you a very small portion of knowledge with regards to the rule. <coughs> Was everything were created through natural stages. When it comes to the rule, the rule is one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created by only saying kun. Kun fayakun be and it came into existence. So as Adam and Islam will have been created in different stages and the entire dunya were created in different stages the room was not created in different stages it is one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said was kun fayakun be and it came into existence <coughs> another thing we notice in this, this ayat is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah wanted, Allah could have gone into details. Allah could have tell them, this, you know, the soul is created from such and such, and the soul is like this, and the soul is like that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has restricted it to that amount which is beneficial to them. They don't need to know anything more about the soul. And we don't need to know anything more about the soul other than Allah has given it to us and it is our life. And we need to use it in a way pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah did not go into details because going into details is not going to bring about any benefit. Sometimes the more details there are, is the more confusion there is. The more you get into certain things, is the more you start to become confused about it. So Allah has given us in the Quran, even though they ask about it, Allah saw that it's not befitted for them to get full details about it because they will not be able to comprehend it. So Allah does says, say to them, the rule is from the affairs of my Lord. The rule is from the affairs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are given too much knowledge about that and he is closed, that was it. He answered the question. So with that inshallah we complete verse 85. Next week inshallah we're going to be doing verse 86. And, um, Friday inshallah as you know we started back our Qatim al-Quran. So our brothers will have completed their jaws already. So this Friday, inshallah, we're going to have the dua for the Fatim quran which will be done by our Imam. He will be doing the dua, and as well as they're going to, he's going to speak a, a few minutes about Qurbani, as you know, Qurbani is coming up very soon as well. Some of the laws and so concerning Qurbani. So it's something good that we should join on. It is going to be on Zoom, so we're all asked to join on Zoom, as well as if you can make it in the masjid, you come, you listen to the, a few laws and so concerning Qurbani to make sure that what you're heading to about your Qurbani is being done in the correct manner and the correct way. And at the same time, you get a dua for the Khatam al-Quran. Because whenever we complete the Quran and you make dua, that is one of the times that Allah accepts our duas. So whatever we ask for at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our duas at that time. So all are invited, Friday come in inshallah. So say you there, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashallu la ilaha illa anta, nasakfiruka wa natubi ilayk, subhanahu wa rabbika wa rabbil izzati amma yisifun, assalamu ala al-mursi wa alhamdulillah wa rabbil alayhi wa sallamu 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 alayhi wa sallamu